The pursuit of the American dream, it's what so many people strive for. The house, the family, the successful career, and that's what one California woman had finally achieved. She had it all and worked so hard to get it. But all of that changed in an instant when she was completely caught off guard with only seconds to live. Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. I'm Kimberlea. If you've never been here before, it's nice to finally meet you. Today's case is actually very different from the ones that I've covered before, and that's why I wanted to share it with you. Also, thank you so much for all the merch suggestions. It's definitely something I would love to work on. But before I jump in, I'd like to introduce you to one of our longtime sponsors making this video possible, and that is Dipsy. We use our phones for everything these days, you're most likely watching this video on your phone right now on the YouTube app. And there's an app for everything, including the Dipsy app to indulge in some fantasies. It's an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. Think of it like a romance novel, but brought to life with audio, including immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. So it's best to listen with headphones on so you can really lose yourself in the moment. All the stories are told by narrators with soothing voices, helping you to get wrapped up in second chance romances, adventurous vacation flings, and hot and heavy hookups, you name it. And if you love falling asleep to a good story, Dipsy has soothing sleep stories. Those are the ones that I really like, especially with all the sounds that just soothe you to sleep. Or you can explore a wellness session and even sexy written stories that you can read. For listeners and viewers of this show, Dipsy's offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com slash Kimberlea. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash Kimberlea. Thanks so much to Dipsy for making this video possible. Now, let's get into the story for today. For generations, people from across the world have come to the United States seeking a fresh new start. Whether they're in search of fame and fortune, or fleeing economic hardship, or simply wanting to make a better life for themselves and their families, moving halfway across the world is a life-changing experience. But for those seeking new opportunities, they're willing to do everything they can to realize their dreams. People who have often arrived with nothing have managed to build a life and a legacy for which their families are forever grateful. But sometimes, the happy and fulfilling life that someone has created in their adopted country is ripped away so brutally that it's difficult to comprehend how this could happen. Today's case does take place in California, but in order to understand everything, I've got to take you out of the United States altogether and introduce you to a woman named Aldico Kroniak. She was born on June 8, 1969, in the city of Mishkolts, which is in the northeastern part of Hungary in Central Europe. Mishkolts is a country's fourth largest city and 115 miles from the capital of Budapest. I've never heard the name Eldiko before this, so I wanted to know what it meant, where it's from, and it is a Hungarian feminine name of Germanic origin. It's a version of Ilda or Hilda, and it means battle or warrior. Eldiko grew up with her parents, Laszlo and Juliana, and her brother also named Laszlo after their father. Unfortunately, there isn't much that we could find out about Aldigo's childhood, but from what I could gather, she was extremely close with her family. But life in Central and nearby Eastern Europe was not easy, especially during the 1970s. And I am not an expert in history by any means, but I do like to understand people who grow up differently than I have here in the United States. And what I found out that was happening when Aldigo was growing up is that following the end of World War II, Hungary was occupied by the Soviet Union, which today we know as Russia. And there was a communist government established at the time. The country suffered economically, resulting in an uprise in 1956 as Hungarian people attempted to take back control of their country. But their efforts were thwarted by the Soviets, who killed 2,500 Hungarians in violent confrontations. They arrested and imprisoned 26,000 more and executed at least 350 citizens. The extreme political unrest and instability were the catalyst for over 200,000 Hungarians fleeing the country. 
But for those left behind, especially people of El Dico's parents' generation, life under an oppressive communist regime was very difficult. And by the time El Dico was born, economic and cultural policy reform was just starting to improve. And so was the quality of life. People began demonstrating against the government and living standards were getting better. However, high rates of alcoholism and self-inflicted deaths were still affecting many people as they struggled to live within this kind of climate. I cannot imagine, but I do try to understand as much as I can. And it wasn't until the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 that communism also began to fall throughout much of Eastern Europe, including Hungary. The country's border with the West was finally reopened and democracy was restored. Around this time, Eldigo graduated from high school and then she obtained her Hungarian aesthetician's license the same exact year, and she started working for herself. She was following in her mother's footsteps, who it appears previously worked in the beauty industry as well. When Eldiko had just turned 20, she was already well on her way to forging a successful career path for herself and becoming well-versed in everything involving running her own business. She also knew the importance of the ongoing industry training, and she obtained a medical aesthetics certification, as well as a bachelor's degree. The fall of communism across much of Central and Eastern Europe represented a huge shift in the nature of opportunities that were available to young Hungarians like Eldiko. Until now, the possibility of exploring anything outside her home country was just a dream. But now, it seemed like it could become a reality. Eldiko had valuable trade skills, and she was a very determined young woman. She knew she could work anywhere and become successful. And she knew that she wanted to explore life outside of her home country. So in 1992, the 23-year-old took a leap of faith. She not only wanted to go beyond Hungary, but outside of Europe. And with one suitcase and just $50 in her possession, Eldiko decided to fly to the United States, arriving right here in sunny California. And I can't imagine how much of a culture shock that must have been. Not to forget to mention adjusting to the weather and the lifestyle that until now, Eldiko had only seen on TV shows or movies or read about in books. It must have been incredibly exciting, but also a quite daunting experience for Eldiko to leave her tight-knit community and her family that she'd known all of her life for an entirely new country and a different language. The first thing she needed to do was begin working. So after arriving in the United States, Eldiko took care of the necessary steps to live and work in California. And ultimately, she became the lead esthetician at the spa, the luxurious Newport Coast Marriott Hotel, after obtaining her California cosmetology license. She knew that she only had herself to rely on, and she worked very hard to establish herself as a sought-out professional through her clientele and by making social connections. Creating a new social circle was actually pretty easy for someone like Eldiko. Her friendly, charismatic personality and caring nature just seemed to pull people into her orbit. It was no doubt that these qualities also attracted her future husband, a man named Ranilo Vestil, who was only a couple years older than Eldiko. They just adored one another. Everyone that knew the couple could see the warmth and the love between them. And they also thought they made a pretty cute looking couple as well, and they got along so nicely together. Around 1996 is when Eldiko and Ranilo tied the knot. By this time, Eldiko had also convinced her cousin, Eva Boney, to come join her in the United States. And when Eva immigrated and settled in California, the pair continued building their close, caring relationship. Eldiko called her cousin every single day to check in on her and always wanted to take Eva to explore new places and do things together. But by this time, 27-year-old Eldiko had sadly lost her father just two years earlier. Her brother Laszlo and her mom Juliana remained behind in Hungary. Her brother had his own life and his own family, but Eldiko's mother was now all alone, and that did not sit right with her. She wanted to show her mom how great life could be with her in the United States. The pair were so close. So Eldiko helped Juliana immigrate from Hungary to the U.S., and she was committed to looking after her the best that she could. This way, Juliana could also see Eldiko's future children grow up and enjoy the same warm and loving dynamic with her daughter and son-in-law that Eldiko remembered so well from her own childhood. It gave the mother and daughter great comfort to know that if anything were to happen to Juliana, Eldiko and Renilo were right there and could take care of everything. It's much harder being so far away. 
Juliana did have some health issues, so it gave everyone a greater peace of mind knowing Eldico could quickly arrange to take her mom to appointments and checkups. In 1998, Eldico and Renilo welcomed their son Keanu into the world. Eldico was instantly more in love than she could have ever imagined. She absolutely adored her son, and there was nothing she wanted to do for him. Everything was coming together for Eldico and her little family in her adopted country. She was determined to work even harder so she could get her son to go to a private school, which she eventually did. While Eldico's family was her number one priority, professionally, she was also thriving. Her natural affinity for people, her sweet, charming nature, and her lighthearted sense of humor combined with her ambition, her intelligence, passion, and strong work ethic made her highly sought after as an esthetician. Her warm and gentle manner in treating her clients' concerns meant that she developed a loyal client base who wouldn't dream of seeing anyone else. No matter how bad you felt or if you were having the worst day, Eldico could make you feel better. Whether you were a valued client or her friend, she would even go to her clients' birthdays, even their baby showers and weddings. And just like she had in Hungary in 2002, Eldico finally opened her very own day spa called Mejur Cosmetica. And if you're wondering, this literally translates to Hungarian cosmetics. They provided all kinds of aesthetic services from facials, lash extensions, massages, waxing, and so much more. On Yelp, Eldico wrote that she believed in using only the highest quality products and cutting-age technologies to deliver holistically healing treatments that will leave every client feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. The spa had a five-star rating on Yelp with so many amazing reviews about Eldico herself. One review I saw said, quote, from the moment you meet Eldico, you know that you're in the presence of a woman who has finally honed her skill over the years. Her private practice is a luxurious experience I look forward to weekly for my facial treatments and my eyelash extensions, end quote. Another client said they didn't even want to leave a review because they don't want to share Eldico with anyone else. And I know that feeling when you find someone that's so good at something. The spa was located in a commercial space in Southern California in Aliso Viejo. It's about seven miles from Laguna Beach and about 50 miles southeast of Los Angeles. It's in Orange County, and it's a quiet place to live compared to the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles. It attracts families and young professionals who are looking for a bit of a slower pace with all the benefits of the California lifestyle. And if you love your reality TV, Aliso Viejo is about 10 miles west of where many of the cast members of the Real Housewives of Orange County live. It's also just six miles from where Eldico and her family would move in 2005 in the Wagon Wheel neighborhood in the community of Tropico Canyon. Eldico, her husband, her mother, and her son lived in a 2,000 square foot, two-story, four-bedroom home. It's in a very nice area. Eldico was truly living the American dream. Of course, performing treatments and providing exceptional customer service weren't Eldico's only responsibilities as an esthetician. To maintain her level of success, she had to be at the top of her industry and all the developments and technology all the time. She also had to be an effective marketer with product knowledge of multiple ranges that were second to none. And Eldico was such a go-getter that she eventually established a separate part of her day spa business selling cosmetics. Working in an industry where appearances matter, Eldico was also a walking advertisement for her skills and high quality services. She was effortlessly stylish, always impeccably groomed, and looking glamorous and much younger for her age. In 2003, she updated her qualifications yet again and obtained an international medical aesthetic certification. She also taught others as an aesthetic educator in positions at luxury skincare companies, one is called Provonia International, as well as Yonka Paris, which is a luxury French skincare line. I have not had a facial or been pampered in so long that all of this is making me wanna get it done after the baby's here, just pamper myself. I think all of us have also met someone like Eldico, someone that people naturally gravitate towards. She found her calling and she had this innate ability to quickly connect with people, which made them want to be around her, which is why she was so successful in business. She was authentic and genuinely cared about her clients, which generated repeat business. Aldico was widely respected and well-known as being a good listener who maintained her clients' confidence. She was compared to like a hairstylist that you tell all of your secrets to every time you have an appointment. She was more than just someone providing a service. She was a truly remarkable woman 
and a great friend to everyone who knew her and loved her, even to people back home. Whenever she would go back to Hungary, she would always bring back souvenirs for everyone in her life, even if that meant picking out 30 different knickknacks to bring with her. She wanted everyone to know that they were loved. And that's another thing. One of Eldiko's biggest passions was traveling, which she regularly did, usually back to Europe to attend industry training events and conferences to grow her skills, as well as her business. But she also liked to travel for pleasure, in addition to her trips back to Europe and Hungary to see her brother Laszlo and his family. Eldiko thoroughly enjoyed discovering more of North America, as well as heading off to places like Mexico, Cuba, and Thailand, just to name a few. I have never been to Europe. I want to know what is your favorite place to travel. I like learning about you as well. In mid-2016, Eldiko's son, Kiana, was off to college at Washington State University, and she could not have been prouder. Her son played the tuba in the college's marching band, which played at the Washington Huskies football games, and Eldiko was thrilled to be able to attend one of these games in Seattle to see her son in action. Another highlight for the family was in late 2017, when Eldiko treated her mom, Juliana, and her mother-in-law, Pirita, to tickets to the filming of the TV show, The Price is Right. I found a lot of pictures on Facebook of them enjoying their time, and it looks like so much fun. By 2018, things were really busy for Eldiko. By now, she relocated her day spa after the building that she originally rented from was sold. She moved to a corner suite on the bottom level of a two-story, 11,000-square-foot red brick commercial building at 11 Mary Blue. It was still located in Aliso Viejo and a little bit closer to her home, only a 15-minute drive. The complex housed multiple businesses, including a chiropractor, a massage therapist business, and mostly medical offices. Palm trees and manicured lawns lined the side of the building where the day spa was situated, and clients enjoyed a sunny view outside the tinted windows. In March of 2018, Aldico was off to Portugal for some r and r and then in April, her brother Laszlo arrived in the United States for a vacation and to spend some quality time with his sister and her family. They were enjoying the sights and spectacular weather, and he was helping out with some business advice. As well as spending time in California, Aldico and Laszlo actually went to Seattle to visit Keanu, and then they partied in Las Vegas together. The siblings had a fantastic time and treasured the memories that they made, indulging in everything from lavish meals and even getting mani-pedis together. But soon it was time for Laszlo to return home, and Aldika was still caring for her mom, Juliana, who by now, sadly, was suffering from dementia. Luckily, Renilo did such a great job caring for his mother-in-law, he was always there to step in and help out when Eldiko was working or getting some much-needed time away. On May 5th, Eldiko headed back to Hungary, but this time she was visiting on business. She was excited to be bringing new high-tech facial treatments back to her day spa in California, which she knew would give her clients amazing results. When she arrived back to the U.S. about a week later, she couldn't wait to get back to work and see not only her family, but her clients, because she really missed them. It was nice to get away, but she loved running her business. But everything changed. On May 15th, 2018, just after 1 p.m., a 911 call came in about an apparent fire and possible explosion at a commercial building where Aldico's spa was located. Emergency personnel rushed to the scene. The building was smoldering and gray smoke was rising from inside what was left of a portion of the corner area facing the roadway in Mary Blue. When firefighters arrived, their immediate priority was evacuating not just the commercial building that was smoking, but the surrounding buildings as well, including a child care center located just across the street. More than 100 scared and confused toddlers were holding hands as child care staff and firefighters guided them to the designated safe area while authorities moved in. There were even babies still inside their cribs that had to be wheeled out to safety as part of precautionary measures. No one knew exactly what happened but many nearby heard the blast that sent plumes of smoke as well as debris flying through the air. Some thought it was fireworks. Other imagined maybe a pipe had burst or there'd been some kind of gas leak that went undetected until it blew up. It was easy to see that a portion of the building had been demolished. Shattered tinted glass was lying on the grass out front. You could see pink insulation hanging from what was left of the corner of the structure. And peering inside broken windows, it was evident the interior was blown apart. 
Tons of debris littered the inside and outside of the building. This once quiet area was full of chaos in just minutes. People fleeing the building were scared. They didn't know what was happening or if they should expect yet another blast. Andrew Dijek, who owned a massage business inside the building, ran out and he saw windows and doors completely shattered. Glass was everywhere and a small fire was burning. Piercing car alarms from surrounding vehicles were immediately set off in a high-pitched chorus as acrid smoke filled the air and debris was scattered throughout the adjacent parking lot. The force of the blast shook the neighborhood as terrified residents and workers wondered if an earthquake had just struck. People working in the surrounding buildings were coming out to see what happened and many of them grabbed their cell phones and took videos and pictures before emergency vehicles had even arrived on scene. Once firefighters were able to clear the area, many other units came out, police, a bomb squad, ambulances, trying to understand what happened here. And the media was of course on the scene as well, interviewing people who had heard or seen something. One gentleman had this to say about what he experienced that afternoon. I hear a loud boom noise along with a jolt. I mean, not a jolt, but a ground shaking, and it jolted me to the wall, so I kind of banged my head to the wall. A lot of people just running around, losing their mind, saying, oh my goodness, what's going on? Where's this person? Where's that person? Parents of the children who were at the daycare across the street were frantically trying to be reunited with their kids. Here's what one mother had to say. It is very nerve-wracking. I think I, I went into tears, so... I'm just, I'm just glad they're safe. I can only imagine how worried these poor parents were hearing that some kind of bomb or explosion went off so close by. They were so lucky. Chiropractor Chris Kennedy, who also had an office inside the building, wasn't there when devastation hit, but his suite was entirely destroyed. Walls and ceilings had caved in right where the employees were sitting. Luckily, none of them were injured and they were able to evacuate safely, but others weren't so lucky. As EMTs and medical personnel came to the building, it was apparent that there were people who had been severely injured and maybe even killed. They came upon the horrific sight of severed human limbs and debris still burning outside in the parking lot. How terrifying. And good Samaritans had gathered around two injured women, a mother and daughter, who were lying on the ground, and another victim had suffered from smoke inhalation and was being treated by medics. The two women, whose names were never released in the media, so I'm going to refer to them as Lena and Ellie, had managed to stumble to safety through a massive hole in the brick wall, despite suffering significant burns and lacerations. They were both covered in blood and ash, with glass stuck to their bodies and singed hair, and parts of their skin were peeling off. They were rushed to a nearby hospital, where they had to undergo emergency surgery, but they were expected to survive. First responders, personnel from the fire department and the Orange County Sheriff's Department had no idea what caused the damage or if anyone was still inside and if they were, what the extent of their injuries would be as they carefully entered the building to investigate. There was still no sign of El Dico. Meanwhile, it was only a matter of time before the news broke. Many people were texting friends and family to let them know what happened. A friend of El Dico's named Holly Salcito lived only a mile or so away from the building and she was on her lunch break when she actually heard the blast. Friends and coworkers began texting her saying that a building on Mary Blue had exploded, and her first thought was El Dico. She knew her spa was on that road, and she hoped she was okay. She texted her, but she didn't get an answer. Another person who thought of El Dico when she heard the news was Sarah Thomas. She had just been at El Dico's spa that morning getting her lashes done, and now she was seeing it on the news, and she thought, Oh my God, a gas explosion happened after I left? She quickly texted El Dico to see if she was okay. Sarah couldn't believe that she had just been there and she hoped El Dico would get out safely if she had been in the building when the blast occurred. It just seems so unbelievable. Hearing the news, El Dico's husband of 22 years, Ranilo, rushed to the scene, desperate to find out if his wife had been at work but investigators told him they couldn't tell him anything at this stage. A woman named Valerie Stone was at work when she heard the news and she immediately thought of her boyfriend, Stephen Beale. Although he didn't physically work at El Zico's med spa, he was one of the people who helped invest in the company and acted as one of the partners. She called him and when he answered, he was of course shocked by what she was telling him. Stephen wasted no time. After finding out, he texted El Zico in a panic, saying there's been an explosion there? Are you okay? 
but he too got no answer. Another friend of Ildiko's named Scott Malali drove up to find pure chaos. He was supposed to be meeting Eldiko for lunch, and now he couldn't see her anywhere, and the spa was reduced to rubble. As many agencies began arriving to assess the situation, a growing number of emergency vehicles were now blocking this street. There were two holes in the wall where Eldiko's spa had been, and as first responders entered, they soon realized that at least one person had not survived. They discovered human remains outside of a broken window as well as in the parking lot. Remember I'd mentioned severed limbs? It is just unreal. Someone hadn't made it, and that someone wasn't identified or announced for some time, since as you can imagine, it's not a very easy task, but eventually it was confirmed that the one and only fatality had been 48-year-old Aldiko Kroniak. You can only imagine what happens to someone who is in an explosion but nothing was given to the media at this point. Initially, some suspected maybe a car had crashed into the building, but when it became apparent it was an explosion, people started wondering if this was a tragic accident, like a gas leak, or if it was something more sinister. One of those people was Officer Jack Ackerman. He knew that in March of that same year in Texas, there were bombs that were being sent all over causing the same outcome, and he wondered, if this could be some kind of copycat crime. Special Agent Ashley Miracle was sent to the hospital to get statements from the surviving victims, and Lead Agent Nick Vicencia was sent to the scene. There was a huge debris field that was going to have to be picked apart piece by piece to find the source of the explosion, and time is of the essence, because they knew they probably had a bomber on the loose. This didn't appear to be an accident. It was apparent that the amount of damage was extensive, and after the building was cleared for secondary explosive devices, officers located the origin, or what's called the seat of the explosion, which had been near the front counter of Eldigo's med spa. This ceiling was blown open and the floor of the building above had buckled. What law enforcement did right away was establish a command post and a dedicated tip line. And one of the people to call in was Steven, who I mentioned earlier. He's a 59-year-old. He lives in Long Beach. And he told law enforcement that he was one of the co-owners and partners of Eldico's spa. He had been alerted to the explosion by his girlfriend, Valerie, and he wanted to know if Eldico was okay and what happened. He said he texted her at 3.15 that afternoon, but got no answer. While Orange County Sheriff's Investigator Jack Ackerman and the FBI, who were assisting in this case, thought if Eldico's spa could have been the target. That meant anyone connected to her or the business could be at risk. So law enforcement knew there could be a possibility a bomb may have been sent or placed at Stevens' home as well. So bomb technicians, including Deputy Stedman and FBI Task Force Officer Hickey, rushed to Stevens' Long Beach home at 7103 East El Paso Street. This is a little over 30 miles from the spa. They wanted to assess if he was at risk. Once they arrived, they told him to get out of the house. They saw there were a number of deliveries at his doorstep. One of them could be deadly. So they placed Stephen in safety in a patrol car nearby as bomb experts were given permission to examine the packages. But luckily, after a search of the contents of the packages, it was just things that Stephen ordered as part of a home renovation he was working on. They still wanted to ask Stephen questions about Eldico because she could have been the main target. Of course, they did have to share the news of her death, and Stephen could not believe it. He also said he couldn't think of one person who would want to harm her. He described her as always smiling. She had great advice for people. She cared. She went out of her way to ease your burdens. And many more of Eldico's close friends and family would get the news of her death and also have investigators knocking on their doors for information. Under Sheriff Don Barnes from the Orange County Sheriff's Office held a press conference the following day on May 16th with an update. It was still a fluid investigation, but listen to everything that had already been done and how many different agencies were working on this case. When we arrived, we found one victim deceased at the scene, and we found two additional victims injured during that explosion. The injured victims are recovering at a hospital. They're currently undergoing surgery and are expected to survive. A third victim suffered from smoke inhalation at the scene, was treated by Orange County Fire Authority and released. The first priority of the Orange County Sheriff's Department and the Orange County Fire Authority was to render the scene safe. We worked in a unified command with the Fire Authority and were able to do that 
in very short order. Orange County Fire Authority brought more than 70 firefighters, which included paramedics, hazardous materials specialists, urban search and rescue, arson investigators, and the Joint Hazard Assessment Team, known as JHAT, to manage the incident. The Orange County Sheriff's Department dedicated numerous resources, including our initial patrol response, our critical incident response management team, our critical incident response team, our bomb squad, tactical teams, uh, the Orange County Intelligence Assessment Center, working to monitor the incident, uh, mobile field force, and numerous investigative resources. Wow, so over 100 people from many different agencies were there in assisting in search and rescue, and of course, investigating what caused this to occur. Here the sheriff explained what they did when they got on the scene. We immediately began to evacuate the surrounding businesses, including a preschool with more than 100 children. We'd also like to thank those from the adjacent businesses and the preschool for their cooperation, their, uh, the ability to evacuate promptly, and their subsequent re, uh, reunification efforts that took place. The Orange County Bomb Squad and Orange County Fire Authority hazardous, hazardous materials team worked jointly to ensure there were no items that would cause a secondary explosion. The hazardous materials team from the Orange County Fire Authority remains on scene to assist as part of this investigation. So at the time, they eliminated there being another threat in that area. And the deputy went on to explain what an extensive investigation this was and how fast things can change. We also called in our federal law enforcement partners from the Federal Bureau of Investigation, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, and other federal agencies to assist in the investigation. I'd like to remind you that while we're still in the preliminary stages of the investigation, as you can imagine, this is a fluid situation. I will share with you that what we believe to be true at this time but as we've seen throughout the course of investigations like this, information changes rapidly. Working jointly, once the scene was declared safe, we began a full investigation into the cause of the explosion. The sheriff is about to give the public their theory on who was targeted and how the explosion occurred. But before I play that for you, I want you to know what happened with the two surviving victims, Lena and Ellie, who they were, as well as the timeline of what they knew before the incident occurred. When the agent went to the hospital to interview the mother and daughter, she found out that they had been inside the spa when the explosion occurred. On May 15, 2018, 48-year-old Dildico returned to work. The spa had been closed while she was away, so like many business owners, she had a lot to catch up on, and she had to tend to all sorts of tasks in between treating clients. That morning, her friend and client, Sarah Thomas, I told you about her earlier, she came in for an appointment to have her lashes done. They caught up on all the gossip from Odigo's trip, and then Sarah left. Next to come in were Lena and Ellie, who are regulars and also Hungarian like Odigo. When the women were all finished up around 1 p.m., Lena was paying for their treatments at the front counter while Ellie went to get something to drink. Lena noticed Eldico pick up a cardboard box that had been sitting next to the counter along with a pile of mail and several other boxes. Eldico set the box on the counter and began using a tool to open it like you would with a letter opener. And suddenly, the next thing Lena recalls was a bright light and then the spa exploded. Windows and doors were blown out throughout the bottom level of the building and then there was just chaos. The spa was immediately plunged into darkness as the sound of smashing glass and plumes of smoke and dust were everywhere. Neither woman recalled anyone else being in the spa that morning besides Eldico. Now, there were other practitioners that worked there, but since Eldico had just returned from her trip, it appeared as though she was just getting back in on that Tuesday. Lena had a very clear recollection of the appearance of the box that she recalled Eldico opening just before the explosion. She said it was a rectangular box like a shoebox, but not very wide. She also remembered an incredibly bright, hot flash of light when Aldico opened the package. And then a loud boom and a massive wave of heat and pressure, which she said blew her backwards onto the floor, causing flames and black smoke. Ellie actually had to dig her mother out of the rubble and pull her to safety. And sadly, one of Lena's eyes could not be saved due to a shrapnel injury. The women were grateful to be alive. Now, Ellie did not see Eldico open the package, but she felt and she heard the explosion and was knocked to the ground. Ellie described seeing everything on fire. 
Following the explosion, the mother and daughter managed to find each other in the smoke and the dust and darkness, and they exited the building and waited for help to arrive. But Lena did not see what happened to Aldico. As the minutes and then hours passed, it was looking more and more like the 48-year-old mom, wife, and business owner was the target. She had been killed less than a month before her 49th birthday. But investigators held back on publicly releasing this information at this stage. But those close to Ildiko had a feeling. Her friend Holly noticed that all of her texts were green instead of blue. That was one of the first signs that Ildiko had not made it. The explosion occurred at approximately 1.05 p.m. And here are some still frames from the Chiropractic Center surveillance video at 1.42 p.m. as first responders arrive inside. And you can see them enter the door. There is the caved-in ceiling, blown out walls, and debris. Now let's listen to what else the Under Sheriff Barnes told the public the following day. We believe that a business on the first floor of 11 Marablu, our female victim was killed by an explosion that occurred within that office. The business operates as, as a day spa. Evidence collected and what we believe are involved in the explosion are not consistent with items that would be used at a day spa. We do not believe at this time that this was an accident. At this time, we have ruled out the potential for this to be an accident, as I said, due to the condition of the victim. We are still working to officially identify her through the Orange County Coroner's Office. However, based on our investigation, we believe the victim is Ildiko Krasniak, 40 years old, from Tribuco Canyon. Ildiko is believed to be the owner of the day spa. Three search warrants were served earlier this morning. At this time, there are no arrests uh, in, in regards to this investigation. Investigators are still working to confirm whether or not this was an intentional act. We are, however, investigating this as a crime, and Sheriff's Homicide is the lead investigator in this case. So there you have it. The items that they had collected and information they gathered showed that they don't think this is an accident. The items were not from the spa, since we were told from Lena that Aldico was opening what looked like a package, like mail. The officer also preliminarily announced that Aldico was the single fatality. Though the explosion didn't appear to be an accident, any larger threats to the community had been ruled out. The motive wasn't clear, but terrorism had also been eliminated. As they continued to investigate, they realized if a device had exploded, it was going to be challenging to recover every single component of something so destructive, and it was going to take time. The FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force was immediately called in to assist. Lead Agent Nick Vicencia and Special Agents Ashley Maracle, Chris Denning, Matt Jimenko, and FBI Task Force Officer Rob Warren were assigned to this case. They would be assisting the Orange County Sheriff's Department, which was leading this investigation. As the undersheriff explained to the public, the hazmat team was there. Agents from the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives were there. Department of Homeland Security. Meanwhile, investigators continued talking to Ladico's family and friends, and one thing stood out right away and that was Eldiko's relationship with her husband. They learned that although Eldiko and Ranilo had lived together, they had been going through a separation. Friends and Eldiko's cousin Eva explained that the couple was in love, but as the years wore on, they grew apart. Ranilo was great, and Eldiko loved him and cared about him, and he cared deeply about Eldiko and Eldiko's mother, Juliana. He took really good care of her. But over time, they realized they were looking for different things in life. So for the last couple of years at least, Eldiko had been dating other men, and Ranila was aware of this. And they did have some kind of arrangement between the two of them. It was personal, and no one knew the exact details because that was their private business. And Eldiko did not like sharing information about her relationship with her husband. But on the other hand, she didn't mind sharing things about her other love interests. Holly said that she knew that Eldiko had at least five or six other men over the last few years. That was important. Could one of them be involved in this explosion? Eldiko's client, Sarah, who was at the spa that morning the blast occurred, said that Eldiko had shared her excitement about a more recent guy that she had been seeing out in Sacramento. She mentioned wanting to get more serious with him. Investigators wondered, 
Maybe Ranila was upset about this. After he had driven to the spa upon learning about the explosion from his brother and getting no response from Eldico after texting her, he drove straight home, as the police instructed him to do. But unbeknownst to Ranilo, they were watching him. They soon arrived with a search warrant for the home, and this search was extensive. It went through the evening and into the next morning. Despite boxes and boxes of items seized from the home, ultimately nothing in the residence or about Ranilo's demeanor led authorities to believe that he was some kind of vengeful husband. He was genuinely distressed that the mother of his child, who he had a deep respect and love for, had been brutally killed. Now up in Washington, Keanu had initially received a concerning message from one of Eldiko's friends asking if Eldiko had returned from Hungary and if she was okay. They said that something bad happened. Keanu had no idea because he didn't speak to his mom that much now that he was away at college, but he did a quick internet search which initially revealed that a car had crashed into the building where the spa was located. So Keanu immediately tried to contact his mom that day, but there was no response. As he was frantically refreshing the internet search, the news got worse. He found out it wasn't a car that crashed into the building. The articles were now saying that there had been some sort of explosion. Keanu was not able to get through when he tried calling the Orange County Sheriff's Office. So he began contacting every hospital in the area but his mom was not admitted to any of them. How sad is that for a son to be trying to find out information from the internet and not knowing what was going on? When Keanu was eventually told by the FBI that the person who had been killed was his mother, his world felt like it stopped. He couldn't breathe. He wondered how could this have happened? He couldn't even reach his father or his grandma because the FBI had seized every device in their home. And to make things worse, TV news trucks aligned the street outside the family home, continuing to capture every detail of the search, of the family, and they weren't allowing Ornilo and Juliana to grieve in peace. They were violating their privacy at such a traumatic time. Thankfully, Odiko's son, Keanu, who had been in the middle of studying for his finals at college, quickly made it home to be with his grieving family. Just days after his mother was killed, he bravely faced the media, and here's what he had to say. There's just so many things that we don't know yet, and there's so many unknown things, and there's, um, it's, it's just all so uh, sudden um, that a lot of this is still very uh, raw. Wow, he did not get to say goodbye. He was out of the state and now left with this reality back home. I cannot imagine how difficult this would have been for someone who is only 20 years old who just had their life turned upside down. With his father by his side, Keanu fought back tears. As he told the reporters, quote, I just really want to express the amount of gratitude that I have for the overwhelming support that everyone has been giving my family. Obviously, this is a really hard thing for everyone to process. There's still a lot of unknown things. Personally, I would like to express my thanks for all the support people gave, especially to the GoFundMe page, for all the arrangements and getting me back here from college early. There's so many things we don't know yet. It's just all so sudden. A lot of this is still very raw and still really hard to process for everybody. I wanna express my gratitude for all the love and support that I've gotten from everybody. It's just been a lot, end quote. Then Aldico's cousin, Eva, stood next to a family friend, Irene White, who read a prepared statement on behalf of the family, saying, quote, this is a complete shock to family and friends. We're in full support of our public authorities to do their jobs in hopes of finding answers to many of the unanswered questions. Family always came first for Eldiko. She took great pride in finding beauty in everyone. At this time, our family and friends would like to privately mourn a mother, a wife, a daughter, and a friend." End quote. Irene concluded the statement by requesting that anyone wanting to help financially could consider donating to their GoFundMe that had been set up by Eldiko's neighbors. Not only were there now unexpected funeral expenses, but 20-year-old Keanu had to fly home as soon as possible to be with his family. On top of that, prior to her death, Eldiko had been making arrangements for her mother, Juliana, to return to Hungary. So those expenses were also up in the air. Eldiko's devastated neighbors tied ribbons in her favorite color, orange, up and down the street as a way to honor her and show support to her family. Back in Hungary, 
Aldico's brother Laszlo learned the shocking news, not through a personal phone call, but actually from the media. And he could not believe what he was seeing and hearing. How could his beloved sister be dead? It really seemed like a bad dream. And I can't imagine, again, finding this out from the internet. The next step was for investigators to look into who Eldiko had been communicating with and her movements in the days before her death, as well as anyone who might have wanted to hurt her. Authorities searched every suite in the building on Mary Blue. Eldiko's white Lexus, which had been in the parking lot of the spa, as well as her social media accounts, her phone records, and an iPhone that was found in the spa near the blast site. And as it happened, a local sheriff's deputy had routinely checked the building at 15 Mary Blue the night before the explosion, but nothing seemed out of place and there was no suspicious activity. Unfortunately, the security cameras at 11 Mary Blue were not working at the time of the explosion. Of course they weren't. It's like they never work when you need them to. However, there did seem to be some outside cameras in the parking lot and the surrounding area that were being combed through. Since authorities knew that Eldiko had flown back into LAX following her most recent trip, law enforcement pulled security video from the airport. They wanted to see if Eldiko had arrived back in LA with anyone else. Interestingly, they saw her on surveillance talking and laughing at the baggage claim with a man. It wasn't her husband, of course, but that was to be expected. But it didn't appear to be as though this man had traveled with Eldiko because he didn't have a suitcase. So they wondered, who was he? Also, they pulled surveillance from a layover that Eldiko had at the San Francisco airport several hours before she boarded her flight to LAX. And there was another man in that footage. And it appeared that that man may have made his way home from there. The man at LAX met her at the baggage claim. This guy seemed to have possibly been traveling with her. Or maybe he lived in that area. All investigators had at this point were these two men, two potential faces with no names. So investigators went back to interviewing friends of Eldiko. They were also looking at anyone connected to the spa and canvassing Eldiko's neighborhood, as well as Stevens, who was her co-owner out in Long Beach. That's when they get some interesting information. One of Stevens' neighbors was asked if he'd heard or seen anything suspicious in regard to Steven. And that's when the neighbor was like, oh, the guy who built rockets? Hmm. What did he mean, build rockets? What kind of rockets? Well, the neighbor said they were tall rockets that Stephen used to set off in the desert. Well, what do rockets need to get set off? They need a detonator. Hmm. So that piqued the investigator's interest. Stephen was forthcoming. He wanted to help however he could to find out what happened. So he agreed to let Officer Stedman and Hickey get a search warrant for his property, where they end up finding several items of interest in Stephen's garage. These included seven foot tall rockets, rocket making equipment, two containers of a precursor chemical called potassium percolate, two other containers of something called red gum, which is used as fuel and binder in fireworks, and at least three containers of black powder. It turned out that Stephen was a rocket hobbyist. He'd been making rockets for years. It was something everyone who was close to him knew about. Well, Stephen was interviewed about these rockets by Sheriff's Investigator Paleo. He gave Paleo a brief rundown of how he knew El Dico and how he became involved in the spa. When asked how the two of them got into business together, considering Stephen was clearly not an esthetician or stylist, Stephen admitted that him and Eldiko had been acquainted a few years ago in 2016, and they started as friends, but they did have a period where they were together romantically. They did it for about a year, and Stephen was happy to help Eldiko start the spa. Stephen signed the lease on Eldiko's new space at 11 Mary Blue because she had apparently filed for bankruptcy in 2014, so her credit wasn't so good. Stephen explained that his romance with Eldiko had fizzled out, and he started dating Valerie in April of 2018. But he and Eldiko remained very good friends and were still happily running the business together. But he wasn't actively involved. However, he explained it was pretty normal for him to stop by the day spa in his capacity as Eldiko's business manager. He would come in, see how things were going, check for mail, things like that. Stephen voluntarily went down to the Orange County Sheriff's Department to speak with Investigator Ackerman. The bombing had really rattled him and he wanted to talk to law enforcement to see if they knew whether this was an accident or not. 
and why the business Oral Deco had been targeted. As Stephen talked further, he was a valuable source of information. Given his professional and even romantic link to Ladico, he knew a lot about what was going on in the business and with her life. Apart from perhaps one person that he knew from Eldico's past who we are going to get to, he couldn't think of anyone who would want to harm her. Given the nature of Stephen and Eldico's association, the fact that he made rockets. He knew the FBI and the ATF would need to formally search his home and his vehicle in order to eliminate him as a person of interest. So that's why he agreed for that to take place. During his interview, Stephen talked about a range of things. He knew Eldika was separated from her husband. He knew that she was seeing other men, including one out in Sacramento. And recall that that was also mentioned by Sarah. Stephen explained that he and Eldiko had taken a trip to Portugal just prior to their breakup. And that's when he noticed a change in her behavior. Her phone and passwords that she previously had shared with him had been changed with no explanation. Stephen always assumed that while he knew that Eldiko was seeing other men in the past, he thought he was the only man she was currently dating. As far as he was concerned, they were exclusive, and he certainly wasn't dating anyone else. But he could tell things were not the same. And when Stephen did get the confirmation from Eldiko that she wasn't interested in being exclusive, he realized they were looking for different things. After all, Stephen was 10 years older than Eldiko, and he wanted something more for sure. He understood, but of course wasn't thrilled, that Eldiko had hidden these details about her other relationships, including this new man in Sacramento. He found this to be deceptive, and he felt betrayed. Things ended, and Stephen moved on to dating Valerie, and things were going well for both of them, according to him and Valerie herself. The last time he'd been at the spa was a couple times when Eldiko was away to pick up a check to give to the building manager, but he hadn't noticed anything suspicious. And financially, things were working well. Stephen paid the spa's $1,500 monthly rent and half of its operating costs. If Eldiko was having a hard time one month with the business, Stephen would lend her money and she would always pay it back later. Stephen told investigators that he used to work as an executive consultant, but he'd been on disability for some years now due to receiving a diagnosis of something called aphasia. He said the cause was from a dose of lead poisoning. This is a disorder that causes difficulties with speech, language processing and comprehension, even memory loss, and it can severely limit someone's ability to communicate. So he was laying low and helping where he could at the spa. Stephen also told investigators about his hobbies, including his rocket making. He was also big into acting. He had written a screenplay about a soccer mom moonlighting as an assassin. He even performed a magic trick for the officers that were interviewing him. He even said that what he was going through right now could be another creative project. The craziness of having his business partner potentially targeted by a bomber that would make some pretty good materials. This could seem pretty heartless, but Stephen explained, there's a lot of potentially humorous anecdotes that are just wrapped up in the most intense life situations, and audiences can relate to that. Stephen's nature was just that way. He was outgoing, he was talkative, and everybody grieves differently. But of course, he also thought that some of these things could be red flags. So we moved to talking about Stephen's passion for making rockets which was interesting given what the bomb squad had found in the search of his home. Steven said he'd learn how to build advanced rockets from a friend, which he did until he gave up the hobby a long time ago. He said he hadn't been setting them off the way he used to for years, probably since about 2004. He wanted to clarify because of course, rockets have explosive components. Steven clarified he never made bombs. The closest thing he made to something that could blow up was that he once made a small device for a neighbor to help him get rid of gophers. Stephen claimed he couldn't remember what he used for that device, apart from it being a long fuse. It was a while ago. When detectives asked Stephen if he had the skills or the know-how to create something as powerful as a device that had detonated at the spa, he was adamant that he did not. And due to the nature of that explosion, it would require a device that was way beyond his capabilities or whatever materials he might have left over at his home. Stephen told the officers he couldn't even remember what chemicals he had in his garage or when he had even used them last. It was that long ago. But he did take a guess at what sort of chemicals could be required to create an explosion like the one at the spa. 
Now, we couldn't be sure because there were just so many possibilities. Professionals would know a lot more than he would, but he estimated any device would require what they call an oxidizer. This facilitates the fuel ignition element of the explosion. So Ackerman asked if there could have been an oxidizer in Stephen's garage, and he said he doesn't know. He's not 100% sure. He explained that any chemicals at his home would have been ordered online between late 1990 and 2004. From the late 1990s until September 2001, he was also making fireworks, including mortars. But he said he stopped doing that after 9-11 because he didn't want anyone to get the wrong impression. Well, I don't know the first thing about bombs, even fireworks, all that stuff scares me. But remember in the search of Stephen's garage, there was a chemical called potassium percolate? Well, it turns out that that can be used as an oxidizer. It's actually used when you're manufacturing pyrotechnic powders, also called flash powders, both in commercial and improvised manufacturing. But they wondered, could it do the amount of damage of the explosion at the spa? They weren't sure. They didn't have any reason or evidence or anything to hold Stephen, so he left after several hours of being interviewed. His demeanor to them had been kind of odd in investigators' eyes. It was clear to investigator Ackerman that Stephen was intelligent and he loved to talk, especially about himself. Even though his romance had ended with El Dico, he seemed perfectly at ease and relatively unaffected by her sudden death. I mean, yes, he does have a new girlfriend who he seems very happy with. He did have three adult children and grandchildren, and he lived on his own, and he appeared to be a perfectly content adult, even if he didn't seem overly distressed that his business partner had just been killed. But what they didn't know at the time was that Stephen was familiar with heartache, grief, and sudden death. He was a widower. His wife of 29 years had passed away from pancreatitis back in 2008. Even though it seemed like Stephen wasn't involved in anything that happened to Aldico, just stay with me here, because the investigators were conducting a more thorough search of his home and of his 2017 Toyota Prius. Authorities seized a bunch of items of interest, including two pipe-sized, completely improvised explosive devices, which we know as IEDs. They also found E-matches, batteries, a 9-volt battery connector, multiple cardboard and modified rocket tubes of various sizes, and these latter items were components that could all be used in the construction of IEDs. And then they found 130 pounds, yes, pounds, of chemicals and propellants, 80 pounds of which were in Stephen's garage, including that potassium percolate and potassium chlorate, as well as two handguns and a shotgun. When he was asked about the IEDs, Stephen said that he did not recognize them. However, he later acknowledged that one of these was a smoke detonator designed to release smoke during flight so that a rocket would stay visible, that it wasn't anything nefarious. Bomb technicians had determined that the devices found in Stephen's garage could most definitely be used to create destructive devices. So on May 16th, just a day after the explosion, he was arrested by the FBI. He was charged with one count of possession of an unregistered destructive device. Now, this was not in connection with Ildiko's death. The investigators were merely doing their job, and it proved illegal at the time for Stephen to be in possession of these items. He was denied bail by the U.S. District Court and held in custody due to being a flight risk and possibly a danger to the community. The quantity and the nature of those chemicals in his garage were questionable at the least. On May 16th, after Stephen was arrested, Eldico was publicly identified as the victim of the bombing. The investigation had to go on. There were still so many unanswered questions. If the device had been contained in a package, it wasn't one that was delivered by USPS, FedEx, or UPS, because it would have been detected. However, police still didn't know who could have built the device or the nature of the chemicals or the detonator used. As bomb technicians gathered evidence from the scene, anything that appeared to be part of the device was bagged up, and then it was taken to the FBI lab in Quantico, Virginia for further analysis. When I tell you how massive the search was. I mean, just looking at the debris, you can see there are so many pieces of just all kinds of things. It's hard enough to sift through all those little pieces to determine what should be analyzed. As authorities continued their inquiries into Eldico's life, 
They learned that Stephen and the man in Sacramento weren't the only ones that Eldico dated outside of her marriage. What we do know is that law enforcement knew that her husband was not behind her death. But how much did he know about her other romantic interests and the men in her life outside their marriage? Well, Renilo said not that much. But he did tell police that Eldico's handyman named Max, he did repairs and maintenance at the spa. He had a key. And for some unknown reason, he sometimes slept in his car out in the parking lot outside the business. He was looked into, but Max was quickly ruled out as having no involvement. So they had to move on. Now, Sarah had told investigators that prior to her appointment that day at the spa, she saw a man with gray hair, he was quite tall, and he was leaving Aldico's office when she was coming in. And she wondered if that could be the man from Sacramento that Eldico kept talking about. She hadn't told Sarah that that was the guy. She didn't even introduce them. She just said they were friends. When investigators showed Sarah some of the grainy images from the airport, she couldn't recognize the man she'd seen. But police had identified him. The man at the building with the gray hair was Scott Mullaly. He was the man who had a lunch date with Eldico on the day of the bombing. And he was the same man who picked her up from LAX when she arrived home from Hungary after San Francisco. They had spent that night together. Interesting. Scott said he did not know Eldico very long. He just met her a few weeks before that at a casino. In addition to picking her up, he also dropped her off at LAX when she flew to Europe and had driven her to the spa for her first day back at work. He didn't seem to have a motivation to harm Eldico, but investigators checked him out and executed search warrants anyway. Law enforcement had also tracked down that man they saw in San Francisco airport. His name was Laszlo Rabo, not to be confused with her brother. They both have the same name. He told investigators he had traveled to Hungary with Eldico, and they had been casually dating in the months leading up to that trip. He lived in Sacramento, and he was able to prove that he was nowhere near the spa on the day of the explosion. They were just ruling these men out one by one. A decision was finally made by Eldico's family that her funeral would be held back in Hungary. But her many friends, an expansive social network that she had created for herself in California over the years, wanted to pay their respects and say farewell to this incredible woman they had known and loved. So on May 25th, a memorial service was held at the San Francisco Solano Church in Rancho Santa Margarita. Meanwhile, FBI bomb technicians in Virginia continued analyzing the 300 pieces of evidence from the site of the wreckage. It was incredibly time-consuming. There were these tiny, tiny pieces spread across an 80 to 90-foot area. Then 10 days after the explosion, near the location that they believed to be the blast seat where it began, firefighters recovered significant remnants of the bomb's components. This included the outer covering of a CVS store-branded 9-volt battery. It had been completely ripped open. The force of the explosion was so powerful that the inner cells from the battery were lodged in the ceiling. A cell phone was also found, as well as melted material that appeared to be duct tape and loose wires. Like the battery, these items were extremely damaged. As the painstaking work continued, these technicians deduced what type of device had killed Eldico. It had been concealed inside that cardboard box, and it was something called a flash powder bomb. The mechanism to set the device off was tripped when the box was opened and was powered by that 9-volt battery. It was clear that whoever had built this device was in no way a beginner. Even though the various components were still something that someone could buy over the counter at any retail store, it was constructed by someone with sophisticated knowledge of how these things worked, including the combination of electric fusing systems and chemicals. At the same time, Investigators had been analyzing terabytes worth of financial records, security footage, phone records, and data, and online activity by Aldico. They also spoke to her husband again, and he had some more information about someone who really hated Aldico. And it wasn't a man. It was a woman. Remember I said that Stephen had also mentioned someone that he knew didn't like Aldico, and I said we would get to that later? Well, that's now. It turns out that back in 2015, Eldico had a fling with a man named Gabor Pap, who lived not too far from the day spa 
Well, Gabor's wife, Elizabeth, was suspicious of her husband's impromptu outings and followed him one day, and she caught him having sex with Eldiko at the spa. And let's just say things escalated. It wasn't good. Gabor initially told Eldiko he was planning on leaving Elizabeth, but that wasn't exactly the case. So after this big blowout, Gabor stopped seeing Eldiko and stayed with his wife, and things seemed to be resolved until... Eldiko reached out to Gabor two years after the dust had settled in 2017. Elizabeth actually saw Eldiko driving past their home, and she decided she wouldn't be fooled twice. She contacted both Eldiko and Renilo in an attempt to get Eldiko to back off. Elizabeth texted Eldiko these explicit photographs, which by all accounts appear to have depicted Elizabeth and Gabor in a sexual manner. It was a way for Elizabeth to gloat to Eldiko about being the winner in this situation. Renilo, on the other hand, he received messages from Elizabeth demanding that he do something about his wife pursuing her husband. First, Elizabeth said, quote, she almost destroyed my family. Enough is enough, end quote. But as recently as April 2018, which would have been just a month prior to the explosion, Elizabeth contacted Ronilo again, saying, quote, please ask your wife to stop contacting me or my husband. She did it again. Any contact from her is not welcome for us, end quote. When Ronilo suggested Elizabeth take some initiative by maybe blocking Eldiko on social media, Elizabeth was irate. She replied, really? You're so blind and accept what your wife is doing instead of stepping up. Be a man. But we know that there was an arrangement between Eldiko and Ronilo. It wasn't exactly his concern. And Eldiko was apparently unfazed by Elizabeth's hatred. And while Elizabeth seemed to have Eldiko in her crosshairs, Eldiko told her friends she wasn't even concerned about any risk to her safety. But that didn't matter. Investigators still called Gabor and Elizabeth in for interviews. And Elizabeth was open about how much she despised of Eldiko but the couple happily agreed for authorities to search their entire home and forensically analyze their cell phones. Even though Elizabeth had a motive, there was nothing to suggest that either her or her husband had the means or the capability to construct any kind of bomb, let alone one that would have killed Eldiko. Now, while all of this was going on, there was a surprising development. On May 26th, federal prosecutors just suddenly dropped the charges against Stephen. He was released. Authorities now admitted that upon further examination of the IEDs, it wasn't clear whether they actually met the statutory definition for a destructive device under the federal law. Stephen was free to go, but of course investigators were still watching him like a hawk. But publicly, they were emphasizing they wouldn't be naming any suspects in the spa bombing until they had sufficient evidence to do so. Aldico's loved ones were heartbroken. Even though the charge hadn't even related in any way to her murder, all they saw was a man who could have been responsible and was getting away with something. And that made him more of a suspect in their eyes, especially Keanu. He'd met Stephen once. It was during a family trip to Mexico the previous August. Well, he thought it was a family trip. It was incredibly upsetting when Keanu found out that instead of having quality time with his mom, his grandmother, and his uncle, he was actually going to be hanging out with his mom's boyfriend. He was really upset that Stephen had been invited. He wasn't a fan. So this made Stephen a potential suspect once again. Investigators knew they would find records of messages and calls between Stephen and Eldiko because they had this ongoing professional relationship, which is why it wasn't a surprise to find anxious text messages from Stephen to Eldiko concerned that she would leave him. These were from early 2018, but the messages were a bit over the top, to say the least. When Eldiko asked Stephen for a little space, he threatened to take his own life. Yeah, so he wasn't taking it very well. It also didn't seem like things were exactly over either. Back in April, on April 22nd, after the breakup, and after Stephen started dating Valerie, he texted Eldiko saying, quote, building a relationship with you is the single most important period of my life, Eldiko. You rock my world. You are the woman that I've always dreamed of. I will love you forever, end quote. Days later, Eldiko texted Stephen back with, quote, miss you, 
when do we get to cuddle, end quote. And Stephen replied, quote, miss you too, love, end quote. So clearly, both of them were still contacting one another on more than a business or friend level. And law enforcement also found photos on Stephen's phone from just before their breakup. They were taken on that vacation in Portugal. These were text messages that were exchanged between Aldico and another man. Remember Stephen said that he caught her being sketchy? Well, the texts were in Hungarian, not in English. And it wasn't immediately obvious what the pair were discussing. Turns out, that the person Aldico had been texting was that guy Laszlo in Sacramento. He was the man Aldico had recently gone to Hungary with, and he was the one seen on that security footage at the San Francisco airport. Investigators quickly determined that Stephen had actually taken photos of these text exchanges so that he could have the message translated. Clearly, Stephen wanted to know what Aldico was discussing with this other man. Part of the text conversation involved Ildiko and Laszlo chatting about going dancing on their upcoming trip to Hungary. Well, we already know Stephen wasn't thrilled about Ildiko talking to another man, but this was all investigators had to go on at the moment, so they figured maybe they should do a background check on Stephen. Maybe that would either rule him out or confirm he had a motive to hurt Ildiko. So this is what they found. Stephen William Beale was born in 1959. He grew up in Long Beach, California with his family. He went on to obtain a business degree from Pepperdine University in 1978. By the time he met Aldico, he had been a widower of eight years. Following the sudden and tragic death of his wife of 29 years and the mother of his three children, Christine. Remember me mentioning this? Well, I really wanted to know more. What exactly happened? It was pancreatitis, right? Well, not exactly, because wait till you hear this. In February 2008, Stephen and his 48-year-old wife, Christine, had been moving a 49-pound end table down the stairs of their home. Christine was holding the lower end while Stephen was at the top, and suddenly, somehow, the couple lost their balance. Christine fell, and she was crushed under the weight of the table at the bottom of the staircase. Stephen had also fallen forward and ended up on top of this piece of furniture. So wait, she didn't die from a disease? I'm confused. After this freak accident, Christine didn't die immediately, but she was rushed to the hospital with critical hip and pelvis injuries. Over the next few weeks, she was in and out of the hospital for treatment from complications, and she ended up passing away in the ICU, and Stephen was devastated. However, the hospital staff were concerned when Stephen decided to become uncooperative, he wasn't willing to provide information about Christine's medical history. He initially hadn't even told police that he was present when she fell. But Christine had told everyone after her fall that it was an accident. It was interesting to note that when Christine died, they found out in a toxicology report that she had a very high and unexplained concentration of lead in her body. Plus, it was revealed that just six weeks before this, Stephen had taken out an accidental death policy through his employer. Christine's autopsy report noted that her cause of death was pancreatitis, electrolyte imbalance, and other undetermined factors. Despite the manner of death being recorded by the coroner as undetermined, there was no evidence of foul play and no charges were brought against Stephen in what appeared to be a tragic accident. Stephen later claimed Christine was poisoned due to their home's previous owner making fishing lures in the house. Recall that he too was on disability due to what he said was lead poisoning? Well, it emerged that six months before Christine's death, Stephen had purchased lead tetroxide, a chemical used as an orange-red pigment in paint designed for iron projects. I know this is a lot to take in, is this a coincidence or something more? Christine's insurance company initially refused a payout in response to Stephen's claim for $21,000. The medical assessor noted that it was unlikely Christine had died solely by accident. Well, that's more than interesting. In 2010, Stephen did ultimately win a $550,000 settlement after suing both his employer and the insurer and received the money in March of 2011. Now, following Stephen's most recent arrest over the destructive device charge in May of 2018, 
the Long Beach Police Department decided to look back into Christine's death. But eventually, they concluded that they didn't find anything sinister that contributed to her passing. That's a surprise. Investigators knew that Stephen had a professional background in management consulting, but he'd been on disability for the past 10 years. He actually filed for bankruptcy in 2009, but this was discharged in 2015. There's absolutely no shame in being on disability. However, authorities found that it was very odd that Stephen was able to pursue his passion for acting. He uploaded a lot of audition reels to the internet. He invested a lot of money into acting classes. He'd even had some really minor parts in short films and movies. But I guess if you can't work due to medical reasons, it's important to have hobbies to fill your time and to make you feel fulfilled. To me, it pretty much looks like everyone here in LA, I think most of us have pursued acting at one point or another. But these videos were interesting because remember how I said the basis of Steven's disability claim was his aphasia diagnosis? I told you it can cause severe communication difficulties. If his condition was so bad that he wasn't able to work, it's kind of difficult to see how he could possibly have been physically and cognitively able to pursue acting. Was Stephen fraudulently claiming disability by lying or exaggerating his symptoms? If so, this could be another way for law enforcement to charge him while they were still carrying out their investigation into the explosion. This was sort of buy them time, so to speak. As it so happened, investigators would get a chance to see Stephen in action on stage, and then they could determine how badly he was truly affected by the so-called aphasia. He was appearing in a local theater production of 12 Angry Jurors. How ironic. If you know, you know. It's a play off the movie 12 Angry Men, which is a crime thriller about a jury in New York City. It's a murder trial. And it's frustrating for all of the jury members when a single member of the jury was skeptical, which forces them to carefully consider the evidence before making a decision, which you should always do. It's a very popular film. The FBI went along to see Steven perform in this play. And while he wasn't going to be winning any Academy Awards anytime soon, he gave a very competent and entertaining performance. But was he a murderer? They couldn't prove that. Orange County Sheriff's Department Commander William Baker continued to urge the public to come forward if they had any knowledge of anything suspicious that could be linked to this bombing. We hear it all the time that even the smallest or most insignificant piece of information can hold the key to a conviction. Investigators started combing through Stephen's financial records. And based on what they found at the crime scene, they worked really hard to find out if any of the components of the bomb could be linked to places in the local area that sold these items, which may have been purchased in the lead-up to Aldigo's murder. Detectives knew that the 9-volt battery had come from a CVS store, remember? But which one? When authorities learned that Stephen withdrew some cash from a local ATM about a week before the bombing, one officer realized that the bank was right down the street from a CVS. And when he pulled the store's security footage, guess what? There was Stephen. Guess what he was buying? A 9-volt battery with cash on May 8th. That was just days before the bomb went off. Well, they go to a staple store close by to the spa, and again, he's seen on camera. This time, guess what he's purchasing? A 12 by 6 cardboard box. Yeah. That cannot be a coincidence, and the investigators didn't think so either. It was strikingly similar to the one that Lena had described seeing El Dico open before the explosion. To be sure they were dealing with the same battery, though, investigators traced the one in the device to a shipment that arrived from China to the United States and was delivered to the CVS store, where Stephen was seen buying it. The last piece of the puzzle was eliminating every other individual who had purchased a 9-volt battery from CVS with the same serial number. And law enforcement was able to do this. And even though the wiring used in the device didn't appear to have been purchased by Stephen in the lead-up to the bombing, there were no meaningful differences between what they found and any of the previous wiring found in Stephen's garage. It could have been left over from rocket making. The footage taken from the cameras nearby the spa was also combed through, and finally, a clip from May 11th showed a vehicle resembling Stevens' Prius driving into the parking lot a block away from the spa and then pulling away not long afterward. But still, Steven admitted to entering the premises while Adiko was away. But why did he have to park 
far away from the building and kind of creep up. Of course, though, they needed more. So special agents covertly approached Stephen's now fiancé, Valerie. They needed her help. If Stephen could confess to anyone, it would probably be her. The agent showed her pictures of the aftermath and the images they had of Stephen purchasing the battery and the box. Would she agree to wear a wire and get Stephen to confess on tape? They were hoping so. Now, Valerie at first did not want to even entertain the idea that her fiancé was a murderer, but she knew Aldico's family needed answers. And if Stephen admitted to killing his ex, then she would have to deal with the fallout. And of course, why would you want to be with him if he does? By this time, law enforcement knew that Stephen wasn't as trusting or as unbothered by Aldico's social life. And he lied to investigators about that. Aldico's good friend Holly had told officers that one evening, when she was at dinner with Aldico, Stephen got it in his head that Aldico was cheating on him. He started texting Aldico again and again and calling her, and then he came to the restaurant where they were eating dinner. It was obvious he was jealous, and he was suspicious of what was going on. Other friends of Aldico did not know Stephen's name, but they recognized him from photographs as someone Aldico said she was scared of. She confided in her friends that she was scared that he would stalk her and could seriously harm her. Someone who was possessive and controlling. Wow. But even though this behavior is out of line, it didn't make Stephen a murderer, but it definitely contradicted the image he painted of himself that he'd given to investigators. And this is why law enforcement was relying on Valerie. She and Stephen had a weekend getaway planned in Malibu. So the FBI struck a deal with her. They would pick up the tab for their accommodations if Valerie agreed to wear a wire. They also wanted to put a recording device in her car, bug her cell phone, and their room. There were 25 agents listening in the entire weekend. But to her surprise, whenever she brought up the subject of the bombing and Aldico's death, Stephen didn't react at all. There was no emotional breakdown, no angry outbursts questioning why Valerie was raising such awful questions on their pleasant weekend away. Nothing about Stephen's reaction to Valerie discussing the bombing raised any concern. Unfortunately for Aldico's family, the answers would come too late for her beloved mother, Juliana. In September of 2018, less than six months after losing her daughter, the 77-year-old passed away. And from what we can tell, it appears that a joint funeral was held for her mother and daughter back in Hungary on October 26, with Aldico's brother expressing his profound thanks and sorrow on a social media account. Despite that stinger operation not going the way the FBI had hoped, they weren't exactly back at square one. There were now too many things that made it impossible for Steven not to be their guy, especially the way he voluntarily inserted himself into this case just days after the explosion. He did 10 hours of interviews on three separate occasions. It was clear to police that he was trying to determine early on what the investigators knew. And he also wanted to show them how smart he was. But if Stephen thought that putting himself in the sights of the authorities would make them cross him off the list, it didn't work. Instead, it firmly planted himself in their minds as someone whose potential level of involvement warranted more attention, not less. The totality of the evidence made the case against Stephen compelling. The whole was greater than the sum of its parts. There he was on camera, buying not only a similar type of box used in an explosion, but the same battery from CVS. He had the know-how and the access to the chemicals required to build the same device. And despite his claims, he hadn't moved on from Eldico at all. His text messages, his behavior, it showed what he was really like. On March 3rd, 2019, a month shy of the first anniversary of Eldico's death, Stephen Beale was arrested again and held without bond. This time, it was for malicious destruction of a building resulting in death. This new federal charge potentially carried a death sentence or life in prison without the possibility of parole. After conducting another search of Stephen's home and his vehicle, it was determined that chemical residue in his Prius matched what was found at the crime scene. This could be expected if he had used the vehicle to transport the bomb. At a press conference in the following days, U.S. Attorney Nick Hanna said, this was a horrific intentional attack that killed an innocent woman and severely injured two others. Those two surviving victims will have to live with the physical and emotional scars of this attack 
for the rest of their lives. He said he would do everything possible to secure justice for those victims and to bring the perpetrator to account for what they did. Eldika's friend Irene spoke on behalf of the family again, saying, quote, We are pleased an arrest has been made after nine long months. We continue to grieve the loss of Eldiko, as well as wrestle with the other implications of what appears to be Mr. Beale's horrific actions, end quote. At Stephen's indictment on March 13th, three more felonies were added to his charge sheet. The use of a weapon of mass destruction resulting in death, the use of a destructive device in relation to a crime of violence, and possession of an unregistered destructive device. The mass destruction charge carried a potential death penalty or life prison term, while the other two charges brought a maximum of 30 years and 10 years in prison. At his arraignment in Santa Ana, the six-year-old pled not guilty to all counts. But just wait. There are some more twists and turns in this case. Things were about to get worse for the accused killer when in February 2020, Stephen was charged with wire fraud, social security fraud, and the concealment of bankruptcy assets. Stephen stood accused of concealing $350,000 of the life insurance payout he received after Christine's death. Stephen was required to declare the money to the court in the terms of his bankruptcy, but he didn't. At the same time, the Department of Justice was still deciding whether to pursue the death penalty in the bombing case. In June of 2020, the prosecution finally announced that it would not be seeking the death penalty. Well, I guess that's one good thing for Stephen. The 63-year-old's trial finally got underway in June of 2022. The assistant United States attorneys told the court that this was a case about obsession, infatuation, and control. Despite Stephen telling investigators that things had ended amicably, and the fact that he'd only recently started dating Valerie at the time of the bombing, he had not moved on from his relationship from Eldiko at all. Wow, I actually thought that they had been together a year from what Stephen had said and maybe broken up for some time, but I guess not. It was only in March of 2018, two months before Eldiko's spa was bombed, that she and Stephen took that trip to Portugal, where he found out she was texting another man, and he couldn't handle it. He made it sound like this happened so long ago, and he was okay with it all. But he wasn't. He was humiliated, and he wanted to make her pay. If he couldn't have Eldiko, then nobody could. Eldiko's friends knew she was scared of Stephen and that he could harm her. He carefully planned his revenge in a way that he thought that only he was smart enough to pull off. While Eldiko was away in Hungary, Stephen purchased the items he needed for that bomb. He constructed it at his home, and then he drove it to the spa on May 11th, so it was waiting for her when she returned. Wow. And he didn't care who else was hurt, even killed as a result. The jury was also reminded that Eldiko's life wasn't the only one destroyed that day. It was a miracle that Lena and Elliot survived, but they had to live with the aftermath for the rest of their lives. In a letter to the court, one of the women said, quote, fear has become my foundation and worry my reality. I am a different, lesser version of who I used to be, end quote. While the mother and daughter may have been on the road to physical recovery, the psychological trauma would stay with them forever. It was a similar story for employees and clients of a mental health clinic, which was situated opposite of the spa. Many clients refused to return for treatment, and staff continued to suffer from PTSD. The jury heard that in Steven's capacity as business manager, he had access to Aldico's day spa schedule online and he would have been able to see when she had clients. In the days leading up to the explosion, he had been checking the appointments day in and day out using his own login details, as well as checking Eldiko's Facebook page to see when she got back into the country. If he did want to truly avoid harming anyone, it was too late to drive from the spa to Long Beach to retrieve the bomb, but he could have called Eldiko and told her not to touch the package. But he didn't do that. For the defense's case, they argued that both the investigators and the prosecutors were trying to make the evidence fit their theory that Stephen was responsible, rather than focusing on anyone else it could be. They zeroed in on Stephen from the beginning, and that is true, but there were reasons why. However, the defense said Max the handyman would have been one of the only people to know that the building's security cameras weren't working and was also sending Eldiko unwanted and uncomfortable text messages. They said it wasn't as cut and dry as Stephen being a vengeful ex who wanted to punish Eldiko. Remember, they were in contact and Stephen was respectful 
and sentimental in multiple messages he exchanged with Ildiko following their breakup. And she reciprocated. Remember I read a couple of those to you? There was proof that Ildiko was still open to meeting up with Stephen and being intimate. And this was very close in time to her killing. The defense claimed there wasn't a smoking gun in the form of abusive and threatening text messages or emails. It didn't show that Stephen was angry or vindictive enough to do what the prosecution was alleging. The defense even tried to explain away the battery purchase, saying that Eldico used those same batteries in her spa equipment, so it wasn't unusual for Stephen to purchase one. Nor did they claim it was out of the ordinary for Stephen to have bought a cardboard box. He was in the middle of doing home improvement projects, and these boxes were required to store and move items while he was working. Lots of circumstantial evidence, I guess. Finally, they argued that Stephen was only in the spa for 10 minutes on May 11th. He was there to check if there was enough room for a facial machine that Eldiko was bringing back from Hungary, which she was. After hearing six months of evidence that was collected from 66 witnesses, the jury went to deliberate. As the days dragged on without a verdict, things were not looking good for the prosecution. On August 22nd, there was finally a decision. It was a hung jury. Nine jurors thought Stephen was guilty, but three did not. While the jury felt Stephen had the means and opportunity to commit such a crime, not all of them could agree beyond a reasonable doubt that he had the motive or that the battery had indeed been won in the bomb components. So the judge declared a mistrial. Wow. I told you there are twists and turns. There was no question for the prosecution. They knew they wanted to go straight back for a retrial and Stephen remained in jail until they did so. On June 29th, 2023, another trial began for Stephen. This time, the prosecution led by U.S. Attorney Martin Estrada. They played a recreation video. It was filmed in a controlled outdoor space and used a mannequin to emphasize to the jury just how destructive this bomb had been, especially for someone who opened the box. The same type of device, chemicals, and electrical components were used. One of the most disturbing things about the recreation was that the mannequin was torn apart in a strikingly similar way of Eldico's injuries. There was nothing left of the mannequin's arms, hands, and its legs had been severed. Compared to the crime scene photos of Eldico's body parts, the comparison was chilling. Stephen's new attorneys again put Stephen's fiance Valerie on the stand. She was the perfect person to refute the prosecution's narrative that Stephen was consumed by jealousy about Eldico dating other men. If Stephen wasn't moved on from his ex, why would he have gotten together with Valerie just weeks later? And why would he have proposed to her? Valerie testified that she never saw any signs that Stephen gave a second thought about Eldico beyond his involvement in the business. She truly felt like he was innocent and had become convinced even more so following the failed FBI sting. If Stephen had done this, she felt he would have confessed, but he didn't. Sadly, it wasn't until after Stephen's second trial that Valerie learned her boyfriend had still been texting Eldico after they started dating. I can't imagine how humiliating that must have been, knowing that you're going to court and finally hearing these details. But of course, the reason Valerie didn't learn this earlier was because she was a witness. She wasn't allowed to know anything about the court proceedings. This deeply unpleasant and public revelation was the end of her and Stephen's relationship. She felt like a fool. This time, when it came to deliberations, it was just two hours for them to reach a verdict. On July 19th, Stephen was found guilty on all four counts. Outside court, U.S. Attorney Martin Estrada said, quote, Using his expertise in explosives, Mr. Beale cowardly murdered his former girlfriend, permanently injured two other victims, who were her customers, and risked the safety of many others in the area, including a daycare center across the street. Thanks to the thorough investigation by the FBI, Orange County Sheriff's Department, Orange County Fire Department, and other law enforcement partners, I'm pleased the jury saw through Mr. Beale's efforts to avoid responsibility for his deplorable actions, end quote. Of course, Stephen will still be facing those two separate federal fraud charges, but in early November 2023, he pleaded guilty, and as a part of his plea, Stephen admitted to receiving $1.3 million in disability and $350,000 in Social Security benefits while lying about having aphasia. At Stephen's sentencing on January 19, 2024, the very minimum he could expect to receive 
was the mandatory 30 years in federal prison. Many of Adiko's loved ones addressed the court. Their pain was still very evident when they gave their victim impact statements. Her cousin Eva addressed Stephen saying, quote, she was an amazing person who was loved by many. To me, she was a shining star. I looked up to her and loved her so much. I can have peace in knowing that you will finally get what you deserve. You have single-handedly destroyed my family, end quote. When Stephen himself addressed the court, he was not remorseful. And he said, quote, the only thing I can say is that I always have and always will maintain my innocence. I wish the person who committed this crime was sitting here and not me, end quote. Judge Staten responded to this by noting the cruel and callous nature of Stephen's plan, describing him as likely to remain a danger to the public for the rest of his life. He wanted her dead simply because she didn't want to continue their romantic relationship. The defendant apparently decided revenge is a dish best served cold. The cold, calculating nature of the crime is chilling. Stephen was sentenced to two counts of life imprisonment, a consecutive 30-year prison sentence for the third count, and a 10-year concurrent sentence on the fourth count. Aldika's family was overjoyed at the decision. Outside court, her cousin Eva said, quote, after five years of waiting and wondering, our family and friends have peace in knowing that Mr. Beale will spend his remaining days in prison. She will live forever in our hearts and never be forgotten, end quote. Today, 64-year-old Stephen resides at the Metropolitan Detention Center in Los Angeles. Federal prosecutors maintain that the circumstances surrounding the death of his late wife, Christine, are suspicious. I'm not done yet. There are just a few more things I wanted to mention in the aftermath, but what do you think? What do you think about Christine? What do you think about whether Stephen did this or not? Just this year, in late January 2024, Stephen appealed both his conviction and sentence with the U.S. Court of Appeals. At the time that I'm making this video, the appeal has not been heard, nor has Stephen been sentenced for his fraud convictions. If his appeal is denied, Stephen will die in prison, as parole does not apply for his federal sentence. A restitution hearing is scheduled for April 12th for Judge Satin to determine how much restitution Stephen will be ordered to pay to Lena and Ellie. That's because of the ongoing pain and suffering they continue to live with every day as a result of his actions. We hope for the sake of Arico's loved ones that things are resolved swiftly and they can focus on remembering what a warm, loving, and vivacious person she was. Someone who was living her life to the fullest and worked hard to make a success for herself. She set an incredible example to everyone around her. Her son Keanu continues to grieve the loss of his mother, but he honors her zest for life by focusing on positivity and recalling his mother's uplifting energy, which she encapsulated so well by once writing on the back of a treasured photograph, quote, life isn't always this happy, but you have to keep living on. I'm going to try, end quote. I really look forward to reading all your comments on this case. Aldika was a very special person. She made so many people happy, and it's such a devastating loss to everyone who loved her. I think the jury got it right. They know more than we ever will about everything at trial. Thank you so much for listening to Aldiko's story. I will see you in my next video. Bye.